What does a mathematician have in his garden? Natural logs, roots, and stem and leaf plots, and which are also known as stem plots. We'll be covering in them in this very lesson. So um, here's some data. We're looking at quantitative data now and how do we display them. Uh, this data is for the sum of two die um, after 30 rolls. So we roll two die and I added them together and I got six. Uh, roll two more, got nine. So uh, you wouldn't get nine from one roll. So hopefully that all makes sense. All right. The simplest way to display this is something called a dot plot. It tends to look a lot like a bar graph. So we're going to draw and label our horizontal axis. Include units for continuous variables if you have them. All right. Um, and then you're going to scale the axis to make sure you can cover the entire span of data. Plot the values and put a dot above the value for the corresponding data point. And you'll find it's super easy. We'll go ahead and do a dot plot for this set of data. First of all, in our example here, it's helpful to know is the data continuous or discrete? Well, die rolls, each individual die only has six options, one through six, and when you add them up, that leaves you pretty much the span from two to 12. So, uh, depth, and you can't have two and a half as an answer. So it's definitely discrete. The min, we, as I just said, is two, and the max is 12. So I'm gonna basically cross off each point and then, well, first of all, I had to number my scale there. I'll cross off the six and I'll put a dot there. Then I'll cross off the nine, put a dot there, and the 10, and try to make them evenly spaced. All right, and then we have the eight here, and then the four, 11. So you can see it's building up. See how I'm trying to keep sort of an even spacing there? And there's a two and an eight. And then I just went ahead and put the rest of them in. So you can go ahead and copy that down yourself. And that is our dot plot. Now, once you've created a display of data, you should be able to describe it, whether it's for categorical or quantitative data. Now, for quantitative data, there's a special way to describe it. Um, we have the center, uh, unusual features, shape, and spread. Now, there is another acronym, which I'm also going to teach you. Um, this one is really easy for the level that we're at right now because we haven't talked about the other measures of variability and some of the other things that are coming up. So for center, we're just going to use the median. You learn how to calculate that in middle school. And basically, it's the middlemost point. Unusual features, that means we are looking for outliers, points that seem unusually far away, or gaps in the data. Gaps are interesting. The shape is about the symmetry. Um, and if it's, we say it's symmetric, if you can like fold it in half and it's roughly the same, and we'll say roughly symmetric. If it is not symmetric, it is usually skewed. And it can also be uniform, so that might be a way to describe the distribution. Modality refers to the number of distinct peaks, and one peak is called unimodal. For right now, for spread, because I haven't taught you the other measures of variability, just provide the minimum and the maximum. So tell me the span of the data. All right. So if I were to describe this, and remember, there's more than one right way to describe the data. Some of this is very subjective. So you won't get dinged if your uh, description is like, yeah, I could see that. So our center, that one's pretty easy to calculate. Uh, it's the median, so I like circle until I get half the dots, and half the dots are over here, and half the dots are over here. So the median is between these two points, so it would be 7.5. Now, unusual, we do have a gap at three, but we don't really have any outliers. You might be tempted to say, well, two is an outlier. I'm not so sure it's that far away from all the data. Outliers usually mean unusually far away. The shape, well, we definitely have a peak at nine, but it's and it's roughly symmetric. If I were to fold this in half, it kind of looks like I'm not going to, you know, don't have a huge amount of data points. Probably would want more before I got real uh, specific on the symmetry. The spread, the data spans from 2 to 12 in the set of data. So here we have described this distribution. Okay, Could you argue that it was bimodal? Probably not, because even though it looks like it has a peak here, it's about the same height as these. So, 
and it's, I don't know, this doesn't feel like it's bimodal to me. So there you go. Now I picked some easier um, graphs here that we can talk about the um, center and unusual features and spread and shape. So for this first one, the center is going to be pretty much right there in the center. It's symmetric and unimodal and no outliers or gaps. This next one, the center is a little trickier. So what I decided to do is I went ahead and shaded this sort of symmetric piece here. Then I thought, okay, I've got these two blue pieces, but if I add that piece up here, then that's kind of equal there, but I still have extra pieces here. So I'm going to say the center is just a little left of this center, that bar there in the center of the yellows, and say it's right about there. Okay. Skewed left and unimodal. So skew means it's if you were to picture it, the um, the way the average is pulled. And if so if you have sort of a tail going off, the way that tail goes is the direction of the skew. It's definitely unimodal. It's just one mound and there are no outliers or gaps. For this one, the center using roughly the same technique, I would say is right about there. All right. And this is going to be skewed to the right. And I would still say that's unimodal. I left it out. Uh, no outliers or gaps. So we're pretty good there. This one I'm going to say is skewed right. And my center is going to be pulled probably you could say, oh, it's either here or here. You could probably put some pieces together. Um, maybe it's actually in this bar. All right. I would say it's skewed right. And there's definitely a gap in the data. You see that? And there's your outlier. This next set of data, the centered, you could have said, well, it's almost right there. But because of that little bit of extra data gets pulled right here. Okay. And uh, we'll say that it is fairly uniform and there are no gaps or outliers. Is it exactly uniform? No, but it's, you know, roughly uniform. This one, uh, the center, I would say is right about there, roughly in the center. It's bimodal because it has two peaks and no gaps or outliers. So let's go ahead and go to the next type of plot, which is a stem plot. Um, here are some actual grades from a test in one of my statistics classes. Now, why wouldn't I want to use a dot plot for this? Well, I think the lowest grade in here is in the 50s and my highest grades in 100. So I'd have like 50 different piles. So the data is just too far spread out. The, it spans too, the span is too big and it would just not be as interesting if I plotted every single little point. Now a stem plot is an easy alternative to display a set of quantitative data that has a broad range of values. And it has the added advantage that you get to see each individual point. So if I wanted to do a uh, stem plot of your test data, you could see where you are in the class without anyone else knowing. So what are the steps to making a stem plot? First of all, you got to decide what your stems will be. Usually it's a tens place and higher but it could be a um, hundreds place or higher. Ideally, you should have at least five stems. Um, so what are the stems for my data? My lowest set point was in the 50s. So the tens place there is five and my high point was 100. So the tens place there is 10. So these would make up my stems and you can kind of see them down here, right here in the graph. All right. The leaf that goes with the stem will be the digits to the right of the stem. So the number 80 would have a stem of 8 and a leaf of 0. Now I think it's probably if you're doing a stem and leaf plot by hand and there are some online resources to do them um, automatically but it, they are kind of a pain so I'll tell you Calculator Soup has a great stem and leaf plot which I use all the time. Um, but if you're doing it by hand because you're taking a test or something you're going to probably want to make a preliminary one and we're going to be putting each data point into a stem and leaf plot. So first of all, 80, that's going to, there's the stem and we just put the zero there. All right. 97, the stem is nine. We put a seven, we put a seven right there. 83 would be going right here. 86. Notice how I'm not writing 83. I'm just putting the ones place here. 77 would go there. 100 would go there. 
68, 80, would add another zero here. There's in the 68, 58, 77, 77, 58, 86, and then 90. Oops. And the rest of your stem and leaf plot right there. So I just went ahead and filled it all out. Now, the, why is this a preliminary stem and leaf plot? The problem is this line right here and this line right here. Okay, so like I said, we want to rearrange the leaves so that they are in ascending order. So again, it's this line right here. I want to take that zero, move it where the three was, take the six, move it over, and then the three, and now that's in the right order. Same thing down here for this line. I want to switch the seven and the zero. Then the other thing is I have to add a key showing what a stem and leaf represent. So you can see eight and zero, this piece right here represents a score of 80. And it's nice to have that context there in the key if you can. Now if you have a small range and that has happened um, where you just have like a bunch of I don't know ones and twos and threes and fours and you're only say going to 20 you could actually do what's called a split uh, of the stem. And so I could have two fives or two zeros is my stem. Oh, one thing I should mention, if your number is like one through nine, then your stem is zero because that's in the tens place. You have zero tens. So the leaves zero to four will go um, with the upper, if you're splitting your data, the leaves zero to four will go with the upper stem. So if I was splitting this line with the eight here, I would put zero, zero, three on the top line for eight, and there'd be another eight, and then I'd have six and six. All right, so the higher digits five to nine go with the lower stem. You won't see a lot of split stem plots, but you will see them. Now the other type of stem plot you might see is a back-to-back -back stem plot. So what we're going to do is add the data from the first class to the back-to-back -back stem plot. One important thing is, so here's a new class where I had their data, and I'm going to add the first class in here. Instead of going from the smallest to the largest, we go backwards here. So doesn't really, you don't see a difference there or there or there, but on this eight line, remember we had the zeros and the three and the six, the zero is going to go on the far right and the six is going to go on the far left. And the same thing applies. So this is 80, 80, 83, 86. This is 90 and 97. And then, of course, our 100. And that's how you can make a comparative stem, uh, stem plot. And the nice part is you can say, oh, I've got a gap here, my data span. It's an easy way to compare two sets of data. If I were comparing first class to the second class, I'd say, well, the peak seems to be in the 80s. Most of the kids seem to be, uh, or I should say the center and the peak is in the 80s. Here it looks almost bimodal. And I'd say the center's more in the 70s, maybe even the 60s. Well, you do have that 100 right there. But still, it's, it's lower in the second period class than the first period class. So you can see the advantage to having a back-to-back -back stem plot.